everyone. I'm Adam Brown, and this is Shell Point Today for Wednesday, May 18th. On today's show, we'll learn what to do after calling 911 in a special health connections class. And Ruth Duber is cooking up some shrimp Newberg in her kitchen just for us in today's What's Cooking segment. Don't forget, this weekend you'll have the opportunity to enjoy an authentic Cuban lunch at Martha's Cuban Cafe in Fort Myers. Their reputation for authenticity is locally known, and you can experience their Cuban sandwiches, rated among the top 10 in Southwest Florida. You'll also enjoy their wonderful coffee when you join this outing on Saturday. The cost of the trip is $7 with lunch on your own. Court pickups begin on the island at 1030. Now, it's that time of year when the bungee jumping caterpillars return. The black olive tree caterpillar looks like a tiny worm, but it can spin a silk thread and bungee down from the trees to approximately face level. They will continue this behavior during the next week or two and then quickly disappear. During their courtship, as the caterpillars chew the leaves, it is likely that some of the black olive trees will be defoliated. Other than the nuisance, the caterpillars don't harm humans and they're not going to do any long-term damage to the trees. Pesticide treatment is not recommended by the University of Florida because honeybees are feeding upon the nectar from the black olive tree flowers and pesticides could kill thousands of bees. So, now you know. If you are looking for a way to get involved here at Shell Point and occupy your time while meeting others and having fun, then Beth Crenshaw would love to hear from you. Give her a call at 454-2290 to learn about volunteer positions in the stamp room or the thrift store. Also, if you only want to donate an hour per week of your time, then you could help out the Pavilion Auxiliary with assembling admissions packets. Just give Terry Kolath a call at 454-2254. Heather Batty has a guest in the studio from Iona McGregor Fire District who will be taking part in a Health Connections class tomorrow. It's called 911, Now What? If you have an emergency, what should you do after dialing 911 for help? In this important class, several guests will be on hand to discuss what happens when you make that call for help, and also they will talk about what happens when you return home after your emergency. To give us more insight, here's Heather along with her guest, Lori McMahon, for more. Hi, Shell Point. I'm Heather Batty with Resort Services. Today I have with me, as you can tell, a very special guest. I'm with Lori McMahon from Iona McGregor Fire. Hi, Lori. Thank you Hi. for being here. Thank you for having me. So what is your exact title at um, Iona McGregor Fire? It's a public education and information resource officer. So that's what we're here talking about. We have an upcoming presentation called 911 Now What? Mm -hmm. And you're going to be there to educate us and the residents about what really does happen when you call 911. Yes, I'll be there, and I'll have a full crew of firefighters with me, too. Excellent. And we will also have two of our staff as well. Um, Dr. Carol Clark will be there, as well as um, Margie Pregent from the Pavilion. And they'll be also discussing what happens when you return after your 911 call. So what does happen when you make that initial call to 911? Well, they want to find out what your emergency is, and that's going to be very important to be very specific um, in the very beginning what your emergency is so they know exactly what dispatcher to send you to, um, whether you have a fire or you have a medical emergency or if you need the police or something like that. Um, then there's different dispatchers that you're sent to who will dispatch the appropriate um, squads out, you know, for for your help. Okay. So we often hear if you call from a cell phone that that's not good. Is that changed now where you can call from a cell phone and they can trace your call or how does that work? Well, it's still not the best method. I mean, um, they don't really, they, they really don't have a way of tracing the cell phone. Um, so you have to give very specific directions on where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, it's always best to call from a landline if you can. Okay. So say it's a medical emergency and um, you arrive there at the scene. What then is the next thing? What information would you be looking for from a resident or from a, an individual? It would be very helpful to know the medications that they're on mm -hmm. um, and when they last took them. Um, 
and if they if they have them available to give to the medics, that's that's always good. Mm -hmm. um, but the medical history of the person is re really what they're looking for. So is that something you would think um, someone should have readily available, maybe typed up or just kind of always available, especially in case they can't give that information? Yes, we, we call it the file of life, and okay. it's, um, it's a great thing that you can just put on your fridge or you type it up and keep it current, um, use a, a pencil if you want or something, but um, keep it current and have your doctor's names on it and maybe your blood type and... Um, any medications that you're on, any surgeries that you've had, mm -hmm. things like that, that they would, it, it would go with you then to the hospital right. and be very helpful for your, for your care. Right. And I guess I've always wondered too, so once you actually get someone to the hospital, um, and then you give all that information then to the hospital and they're then turned over to the emergency right. room or. Right. Okay. It's and then, turned over. Yeah. And then you, so then you no longer have. Um, access or need access to that person any longer. That's right. Okay. Now, how does it work if you um, are then brought home after the hospital? Or is there anything that people need to know if they, you know, are getting transported back in a vehicle or anything like that? Um, I would think with just once you get home to update your file of life and to make sure everything is current on there mm -hmm. and um, to let your neighbors know, you know, if you need any kind of special assistance and um, so they can help you if there was a fire or something and you, you were mm -hmm. uh, unable to get out of your unit by yourself, you know, then, you know, you should let your neighbors know so mm -hmm. they could help you. What is some of, do you think, the most important information for people to know during an emergency? Is there anything you can kind of give us that you think is really important for people just to have a handle on or understand, just to stay calm or? <laughs> yeah, it is, uh, it's good to stay calm. Um, always get 911 on the phone as soon as possible to mm -hmm. let them know. And um, if there's smoke, you know, to stay low under the smoke. Um, if you can't get out, you know, stay near a window or a door, someplace where the firefighters are going to be coming in mm -hmm. so um, they can get to you readily. And, um, but staying calm is, is very important. Right. Um, always knowing where you're at and where your closest exit is is really important wherever you're at, whether you're home or you're in a hotel or you're right. even out, you know, in a building somewhere, just to be aware of your surroundings and know, you know, where your closest exit is just in case there's an emergency. Right. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's good things to remember, especially when you are in a hotel or in a place that's foreign to you to know kind of those exit points. Mm -hmm. So this program is going to be Thursday, May 19th at 2.15 in our social center. And like you said, you're going to be there with um, some of her other staff, as well as staff here from Shell Point to answer questions about 911, now what, and then what happens when you return back from the hospital to your home here at Shell Point. So again, this is going to be Thursday, May 19th at 2.15 in the Social Center. And if you're interested in joining us and Lori from Iona McGregor Fire, please sign up at either service desk. Thank you and stay happy and healthy. And now it's time for some good old home cooking. And for that, we don't have to travel very far. Just over to Ruth Duber's place where today she's cooking up a recipe of shrimp Newberg. Here's Ruth with today's What's Cooking segment. I'm Ruth Duber and this is What's Cooking at Shell Point and something a little different. Uh, I have always loved lobster Newburgh. However, I can't really afford the lobster so we're going to do it with shrimp. It'll be a shrimp Newburgh. Now the recipe that will go up on the website will be um, actually I think it could serve six to eight. So I'm going to cut it in half. The recipe calls for one pound of cooked shrimp and I'm using a half a pound. So I'm taking all the, the ingredients and cutting them in half. And basically, you're, you're making a, a white sauce. Uh, this is half and half. There's my shrimp. 
and I did take the tails off, and it calls for mustard, chili sauce, Worcestershire sauce, salt and pepper. So we're going to go over to the stove and mm -hmm. there we go. Ready? I'm going to turn this, this burner on. And in this pan, we have a tablespoon of butter. Okay, now we're going to melt this butter, this tablespoon of butter, and we're going to be adding, it's a teaspoon, it's t actually three teaspoons, a little bit less. The main recipe called for one tablespoon plus three quarter tablespoon. Now I spent a lot of time <laughs> looking it up to try and see, you know, how much it really was. So I'm kind of guessing it, it's about three teaspoons. Now I found that using the half a pound of shrimp would be plenty for two people. Unless you have tremendous appetites. So that's melting pretty well. And we're going to stir in our flour. And the trick is to not have any lumps. Now we're slowly going to add in the half and half. If you do it slowly, that's how you avoid getting the lumps. I'm going to turn my burner up a little bit. There, a little more light. I like to serve this on rice, and because sometimes I'm lazy, I like to use the minute rice, and this is jasmine rice, and I like that really well. And it cooks in 60 seconds. Okay, so we're going to do this, and you do this in the microwave for 60 seconds. So while this is thickening, let's just go ahead and do our rice. Sixty. I think it's amazing what they have that's available now that <laughs> is almost instant. And it's a half a teaspoon of dry mustard. And a half a tablespoon of Worcestershire. And a half a tablespoon of chili sauce. So I put them both in here. So here comes your flavor. I'm going to take our rice out. Okay. Yeah, this sauce is really good now. So now I'm going to add my shrimp. bit of salt and pepper. Mm. 
Now, if I was a real professional, I would have used white pepper on this, but I didn't think about it, so. I will just let that come up to heat while I get my plate. Turn off my burner. And here you have it. I'll add a little bit of parsley. And I forgot to put the sherry in, but that's okay. We won't do that. Mm -hmm. I have a neighbor that grows parsley. And she brings me a whole lot. And so I chop it up and put it in the freezer. And then when I need it, I have it. So this is it. Uh, I did not put it in, but you can put in about a teaspoon of dry sack sherry, and that will give it an extra little spark. So, but we think it's pretty good. So I'm going to taste a bite here, and I'll put this up on the rest on the uh, website, and I hope you'll try it. Mm. 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 That is good without the sherry. It's delicious. So try it. It's pretty easy. And using the cooked shrimp saves you all the cooking and the peeling and the deveining. I just had to take the tails off. So that's it. I'll put it up on the website. Thank you. See you again. Bye-bye. And now let's take a look at today's happenings, Academy News, Menus, and Village Church Connections. Hello and happy Wednesday. This is the happening segment of Shell Point TV. I'm Caitlin Van Scoy and I'm here with Bev Chanley. We're going to give you all of Wednesday's activities. We start bright and early at 745 with men's Bible study in the Osprey Room. And then there's a trip going out to Octagon Sanctuary. Pickups begin on the island at 8 o'clock, 810 Woodlands and 820 Eagles Preserve and Estuary. You do need to sign up for that trip. Pickleball is available at 8 o'clock at the game courts behind the Resident Activity Center. Also at 8, men's round robin tennis at the Woodlands. Lily and Company Jewelers will be here for their weekly service at 8.45 in the Resident Activity Center. Then we move to 9 o'clock for a watercolor group with Phil Hilton in the art studio. At 10 o'clock, the ladies Bible study will be gathering in the Osprey Room. Also at 10, men's match play tennis will be going on at the Woodlands. The Model Yacht Sailing Club will be meeting at the Commons Lake at the Woodlands at 10.15. And at 11.30, we have a Health Connections class, Bar Ball Edition, in the Tarpon Room. That's it for the morning. Here's Bev for the afternoon. Thank you, Caitlin. We have a Health Connections class at 12.45, Advanced Strength and Conditioning. That's in the Tarpon Room on the island. We have Chess in the Library Lounge at 1 o'clock. And we have a 1.45 Health Connections class Osteo Break Free. That's in the Tarpon Room. It's currently full. At 2 o'clock, we have Preventing Chronic Health Conditions. That'll be in the Oak Room of the Woodlands. You do need to sign up for that. Knitters Anonymous will be in the Osprey Room at 2.15. And at 2.30, we have Jazz and Stuff. That'll be in the Grand Cypress Room at the Woodlands. Pilates Stretch will be in the Tarpon Room at 3 o'clock. And we have the Singles Table, once again available at the Crystal Dining Room at 5.00. 5.45, we have the church choir rehearsal at the Village Church, and we round out the evening with a 7.15 prayer and praise at the Village Church. Well, we hope you have a wonderful day today, and we will see you back here again tomorrow. Hi, I'm Terry Coleth with your Academy information for Wednesday. At 9 o'clock, Paper Bag Scrapbook Album continues in the Sable Room of the Woodlands. At 10 o'clock, Bridge for Beginners continues in the Oak Room at the Woodlands. Also at 10 o'clock, I've Been Wondering, will take place in the Grand Cypress Room of the Woodlands. At 1 o'clock, Intermediate Bridge will continue in the Game Room at the Woodlands. Menus for Wednesday, May 18th. In the Crystal Room, the platter is chicken and broccoli alfredo with garlic bread and roasted tomato. 
For dinner, it's the All-American Buffet for $14.95. The soup is Duchess. In the Island Cafe, it's a chicken parmesan sandwich with side toss salad for $7.75. And in the Palm Grill, there's mushroom stuffed pork loin for $14.95 or fried shrimp for $15.95. All menus are available 24 hours a day at shellpoint.net. Welcome to Village Church Connections. I'm David Pavey. Some time ago, I read a book entitled Rumors of Another World by the celebrated author Philip Yancey, who wrote it specifically for those who live in what he calls the borderlands of belief, the region between belief and unbelief. Quote, he wrote it for those who were skeptical of religion and turned off by the church, which is why he entitled it Rumors and not Proofs. Yancey wants us to consider the possibility of an unseen, supernatural world of beauty and purpose coexisting with our visible world. In Rumors of Another World, Yancey describes an experience that he once had in Costa Rica. I read it a decade ago, but I've never forgotten it, so I thought you might appreciate it too. Let me share it with you now. Here's what Yancey wrote. One night in Costa Rica, I joined a guided expedition to a government reserve in order to observe a natural phenomenon, giant leatherback turtles laying their eggs. The guide used a red filtered flashlight so as not to disorient the turtles. And at midnight, we trudged for almost a mile along the beach its sand still warm from the day's sun, until we found a turtle preparing her nest. The turtle reached down in the soft sand, one muscular flipper at a time, to scoop out and then fling the sand behind her. As she worked her way down, each scoop required more and more effort. The sand got wet and heavy, and she had to fling it above the rim of the hole she was digging. Eventually, she reached a depth of three feet, her body fully submerged in sand, and now each flinging of the sand thrust her whole body to the side, and despite her best efforts, much of the sand still fell back into the trench. She scooped it up and again and again slung it toward the surface. We tourists from Germany, Holland, Costa Rica, and the United States stood in silence late into the night, spellbound, watching this primordial drama. The crashing surf made a rhythmic soundtrack, and silvery clouds drifted over the moon. The mother turtle heaved and gasped, her mouth opening and closing like a fish laboring to breathe. And finally, after an hour's hard work, the trench satisfied her, and she began to drop shiny white eggs the side of billiard balls. They glistened in the moonlight, gelatinous. We counted at least 60. The last few eggs were smaller, also infertile, said the guide, so that if predators uncovered her nest, these would go first. Her task accomplished, the leather bat clambered slowly out of the nest and began a 45-minute process of filling it in with the sand. Her powerful front flippers made dexterous by separate fingers could toss sand ten feet behind her. She filled the trench, tamped the sand delicately as with loving care, added more on top, packed it too, and then made a wide circle of disturbed sand to confuse any predators. Exhausted, she lumbered off, dragging herself on the sand and resting every three or four strokes toward the sea. We watched as the smallest waves, their foam glowing in the moonlight, repeatedly pushed her back towards the shore. But at last she gained the strength to lunge past the waves, dipped her head beneath the surface, and disappeared. 
The guide informed us that the mother turtle weighed almost a ton and was probably a hundred years old. I said a hundred. The largest reptiles on earth, leatherbacks don't even breed for the first 60 years. I said 60 years, six zero. And of course the mother never sees the results of her efforts. When the babies hatch, they burrow to the surface and make a mad dash to the sea with only a third surviving the onslaught of coyotes and raccoons and seagulls. The sea poses many more dangers and few of the baby turtles live to lay eggs themselves. But those who do will unfailingly return in 60 years to the same beach in Costa Rica, one of only three beaches frequented by leatherbacks. Revisiting the site the following morning, I could barely make out the camouflaged nest. Tracks like those made by a large-wheeled all-terrain vehicle led from the nest to the sea. The mother turtle's flippers had made the rounded furrows, and between them I noticed a much more shallow one made by her dragging tail. I sat on a piece of driftwood and thought of the immensity of the world within the sea. How little of the creation do we humans understand, much less control. The wonders of instinctual behavior, the rhythms of nature that go on and on, whether any humans observe them or not, the comparative smallness of human beings. I made a conscious choice to turn the memory of the previous night into an act of gratitude or even worship. It had put me in my place. It's hard to dwell on the mysteries of the natural world and continue to live in the borderlands of belief. Thank you for tuning in once again to Village Church Connections. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to watch tomorrow when resident Wayne Robinson will give us a preview of his library book talk taking place next week. And Robin Church, manager of the Salon and Spa, will have some delightful beauty specials for us to review. Until then, this has been Shell Point Today for Wednesday, May 18th. I'm Adam Brown thanking you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.